as was said, Christopher Becker, University of Utah. Um, collaborators are also on the slide. Um, Nika Bassett and our, and our advisor, Snea Casera, as well as the um, two collaborators at Idaho National Lab, Kurt Durr and Sam Ramirez. And this is our experiences with using GNU radio for real-time wireless signal classification. And this project is a collaboration between these two entities. Um, just as a brief outline, uh, introduction, system overview, challenges and approaches, setup, evaluation, conclusion. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide a real-time wireless monitoring um, for a variety of, of environments. Um, particularly in this project, we're focusing on high security and control system environments. Uh, some examples, power plants, military bases, water treatment plants, as well as um, shared spectrum, such as the 3.5 gigahertz um, band. So motivation, uh, we have these four broad areas that we're trying to help with. Um, safety and security, especially in the critical infrastructure environments enforcement and interference identification and mitigation. Um, they're kind of all connected, but particularly enforcement would be more in the 3.5 gigahertz band. Um, system overview. So this is actually a system that we have submitted, um, but we need to kind of bring a little bit in just to give you a basic understanding as to what we are doing and why we are doing it. Um, so this is basic overview, high level overview of the system. Um, so we basically, we are bringing in RF measurements. We are sending them through two classification um, paths and then we are merging those two classification results to provide a final classification result. And while we're doing this, we're also providing feedback to improve uh, classification. So here's a little bit more of an expanded version. Um, so as you can see by the top part, uh, we have an energy-based classifier. This is kind of our always on quick um, classification path. And then the bottom path is a machine learning classifier. So with this, um, this is something that is a lot more accurate typically, but it also runs a lot slower. So in order, order to actually keep our real-time um, capabilities, we can't actually run the machine learning all the time. We have to kind of run it occasionally. Okay, so some challenges and approaches that we took to overcome those. Um, one of our big ones was the message passing. So in GNU radio, you kind of have a limited message uh, passing rate, and then the data encapsulation and unencapsulation is expensive, um, particularly with the PMT format. So a couple of approaches we took to basically bypass that. Um, so one approach was we actually used the data streams and treated those as fixed size format data strings that allowed us to kind of use the streaming mechanisms to move data around the graph quite quickly. And then the other one for kind of more unusual data, we uh, actually re um, use QT signals and slots or uh, other message passing uh, wrappers. So um, particularly for the message passing wrapper, uh, I have a diagram here. And what we would do is we would actually take, um, take the input, we'd send it through the regular work function, which would actually send it to um, a QT object. So basically what we had was we had a thin GNU radio wrapper um, that would pass data back and forth between a QT object. Um, so we take that, we'd send it to a processing function within the object, which would then generate the output. Um, that output would then be sent back to be converted to PMT when necessary. If we could bypass the GNU radio message passing, then we'd actually send it via um, QT signals and slots. So step five, uh, we'd send it either by the PMT messages or uh, signals and slots, and we can use a combination as needed. And then on the receiving side, um, again, we would kind of 
unencapsulate the data if necessary, but then we would update and then whenever work function was called within GNU radio, we generate the output and then send it out. Um, so one of the other things, we've had a lot of overflow and drop packet detection. And with this, what we are trying to do is be able to run the machine learning classifier as much as possible without getting into overflows. Um, so basically we want to do that runtime uh, performance tuning. Uh, so we are aware of like the time steps a uh, timestamp set for the recovery, um, but it never really felt like a real good approach, at least for what we were trying to do. Um, and the other challenge was that the UHD driver actually sends information to standard error output, and we didn't really find a way to access that within the GNU Radio API itself. So what we ended up doing actually was creating a separate program to do the performance monitoring for us. Um, and what we would do is we'd actually pipe the output from our program to this separate program, and then we would monitor that for the um, indicators for overflow and drop packets. Um, and then we'd actually combine that with information from the operating system, such as what, um, what the network um, data queues were looking like and things like that, as well as uh, CPU overhead. And then uh, based off of that, we'd actually send information to our classification flow graph saying, okay, um, it looks like you're going to have overflow if you don't reconfigure yourself, so let's start adjusting. Um, another thing, and this is in some ways more based on our actual use case, so in some cases, there were actually a lot of blocks that weren't exactly optimized for our use. So uh, for example, we had the add CC, the log power FFT, and then um, the analog const source. So what we ended up doing, um, we actually converted and used, or for the add CC and the log power FFT blocks, we actually used Volk um, and reduced some other overhead to try and improve the speed. And then log power FFT and analog cont source, we actually changed the interface um, and the internal code to add capabilities that we wanted. And again, to try and reduce overhead. So um, as part of this with the reconfiguration, we wanted to be able to dynamically change the decimation rates at runtime. So within the flow graph, there's actually the one part that controls how much data is sent to the machine learning blocks. And with that, it's, it's a constant amount that we're dropping. So it's a constant decimation rate, but we're reconfiguring that over the course of the runtime. So what we ended up doing, or, and this actually was creating an error because when we pause, reconfigure our flow graph, we'd actually get errors because buffer size mismatches. Um, so it was not updating buffers correctly. Um, so what we ended up doing is basically whenever we stopped the flow graph to reconfigure it, we'd actually have to delete and reinitialize the immediately preceding blocks um, in order to have GNU Radio kind of take care of those buffers and reinitialize them correctly. Um, one of the latest ones that is still an open problem is the scheduler, which was mentioned this morning as a place that needs a refresh anyway. Um, what we were actually experiencing is if we had a large number of threads, we would see um, the thread that actually maintained the scheduler using 90 to 100% of CPU usage and all of the worker threads would maybe hit 2% at most. So um, basically processing starvation was happening. Um, again, it's a complicated problem, still open. What we did just to kind of get our system up and running is we actually looked into combining a functionality of multiple blocks um, into new blocks or allowing more inputs to a single block which just at a high level means we're trying to reduce the number of threads that we're spawning and using. 
Um, we also looked into GPU acceleration um, challenges there, which have been cited in other papers. In the past, is basically a limited data size on, or limited buffer size. Um, just doesn't lend itself to GPU typically because of the memory copying overhead. Um, so what we ended up doing is we tried to use Volk as much as possible and well, as well as trying to do processing optimized um, programming. So for example, heaps and lookup tables. All right, so a little bit of setup. Um, information for the evaluation that we did. So what we did for development and testing, uh, we actually used Ubuntu 14.04.1, um, UHD version 3.11, GNU Radio version 3.7.11, and Volk version 1.3.0. Um, and then for testing and evaluation, we actually had upgraded at that point, so it was done on Ubuntu 18.04, 3.11, one for UHD, 3712 for the GNU radio, and 140 for Volk. Um, and for all of this, we're actually using um, Dell M4800 laptops with increased RAM. So basically, it gives us a four core, two point gigahertz processor um, with 32 gigs of RAM. Um, and what we did for the setup is we basically used the GNU Radio build script um, when that was still available. And we just slightly modified it for um, 1804. Uh, for, so for the evaluation, uh, we ended up using the X310 configurations, or our system uses the X310s in general. Um, so as you can see for development and testing, it was hardware revision six, firmware 5.1, FPGA um, 33, and then for testing evaluation, again, we kind of had a little bit of a hardware upgrade, so eight, six, and 35. Um, and then we were using one, giga, or one gigabit per second ethernet links, which allowed us to go with a 25 megahertz sample rate. Okay, as far as the actual evaluation. So message passing, this is where we saw the largest speed ups. Um, so by using that um, wrapper block or the wrapped blocks, um, we, for the evaluation in particular, we did 4,096 long integers um, via both the message passing and the QT signals and slots exclusively. Um, and we ran this 100 times just to try and get uh, a little bit better statistics. And what we saw was a huge performance improvement. So in order to do that 4,096, our median time for the GNU radio message passing was 0.26 seconds. And by doing the exact same thing, but only using QT, we actually saw um, 0.003 seconds. So. Um, quite a bit of improvement on that, um, greater than 78 times. Um, as far as the non-optimized -implement implementations, again, we kind of kept that 4,096 samples and we ran 100 tests. So for the standard complex add, um, you can see that these are actually fairly close. We did get a little bit better um, by using Volk. Um, and it was the same type of deal between the log power FFT and then our modified PSD block. Um, so you could say, well, is all that effort worth it? Yes, um, when we keep on adding these performance improvements, we actually um, could see quite a bit of an improvement overall. Um, so as far as combining blocks or adding the inputs, this is our first setup. Um, so we had um, separate, which this comes back to the add, um, add block. So what we had is we had, um, as part of our classification, we basically are doing a lot of adds and multiplies. So for the completely separate version, um, we actually had that where we had on the left-hand side, we have a mean, a standard deviation, which is standard but then we have values that are coming from all the different protocols. And a protocol here 
is actually looking for a particular wireless protocol. So that might be Bluetooth, it might be Zigbee, it might be Wi-Fi version, whatever. Um, and we're just trying to do all of this in real time. So we have these values and we actually use the standard multiply blocks, the standard add blocks, and then we just send it to a null sync just to get the timing results. So that's a separate version. Combined, we actually created a um, cutoff calculator block, and what this does is it basically replaces all those adds and multiplies. And um, what we did is we actually did a somewhat combined, which still keeps it as one per protocol, and then we did a completely combined where we actually added, so we had multiple inputs into it. And then, again, we just send all the information to a null sync. Um, so these are the results of actually running this. Um, as you can see, the separate, by and large, takes a lot longer, especially the more protocols you add. The uh, somewhat combined in this case um, is kind of in the middle, but then the combined, which again, just to iterate, combined is where we actually have basically one actual block handling all the input. Um, that combined block or the com combined situation um, was actually quite a bit better overall. Now you could ask, well, how many protocols are you gonna be looking for? Again, is this performance improvement actually worth it? And in, in basically short answer is it depends. Um, so in some of these environments, you're not going to have all that many protocols that you are actually monitoring for necessarily. Um, in which case, maybe not. Um, if you are trying to monitor more of an ISM band, you're going to be probably dealing with a lot more protocols. And depending on how important the security or safety or whatever, is you might be looking for a lot of protocols. So you can range anywhere from just a couple to potentially over 100 even. Um, so, but those results are not always the case. Um, the other thing we did was we actually did a um, combining blocks and, and adding inputs. Um, in this case, we are actually taking the um, data and we are putting it into a custom peak detector block. Um, and in this case, we just did the uh, separate peak detectors versus a combined peak detector. And here are the results from that. Um, in this case, actually, it hurt performance to have all the input going into one block. Um, so in this case, the processing actually was better by dividing it and sending it to multiple threads. Um, so uh, one of the comments from the reviewers when we submitted the paper was, well, how do you explain the jumps? Um, short answer is, it's still something we're looking into. Um, we, or I have actually spent quite a bit of time trying to look into that recently. The best guess I have right now, because um, I was looking at, um, Valgrind uh, data, and from that it seems that we're actually running into hardware caching issues. Um, that after a certain point, we're just getting a high number of cache misses. Um, and just to kind of conclude, so what we found out overall is there are many challenges to using GNU Radio in real-time spectrum monitoring applications. but generally there are also a lot of ways to approach these challenges and to actually overcome them. Um, so we had, uh, did provide some large performance improvements, but it's one of those tricky spots where it's not a one size fits all solution. So you kind of have to tailor it a bit to your own um, system. Okay. And that is it. That's pretty fancy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christopher. All right. Uh, I'm sure we have audience questions. The
core developer Slack channel was going crazy during that talk. Uh, was, yeah, very interesting. Did you have a question, Jeff? Okay. So my question is whether you're able to figure out whether uh, you had alignment um, problems in those buffers because the overactivity of the scheduler plus those steps kind of looks like you might have been trickling out. That's that's my best guess right now. Um, we didn't. We've basically just looked into it the last couple weeks. Um, so still, still something that I can't really confirm it. But looking at Valgrind, it supports that theory that it might be just the way that I have the buffers arranged in the code that I need to try and realign them or um, go along those lines. Any other questions? Oh, I'm right in front of the speaker. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, oh, okay, core dev tables. <laughs> All right, Philip. Do you have test cases you can publish so that uh, people can look at this? Or um, can we make reduced, uh, you know, simple flow graphs that exhibit some of the problems? We're kind of working on trying to figure out exactly what we can and can't release. Um, I think I could come up with some information at least. Yeah, so. What, yeah, uh, yeah, so in case like. The, um, like application in. In so, specific test cases, yeah. Yeah, so like things like this, um, I think we can, you know, obviously I've already released it to this point, which, but um, I think there's definitely some things that we can probably release. Okay, and even if, oh gosh, even if you can't, um, if you like made a very basic flow graph that reproduced the same results, but did nothing else, just like dumping to null sinks or whatever. Yep. Yeah, um, Marcus? So um, yeah, thanks for like highlighting the problems of the current scheduler. Um, this is very dear <laughs> to my heart, as you can imagine. Um, so especially about the serialization, deserialization, and no, actually about the message passing the comparison to Qt. I mean, that was 0.2 seconds, right? And a mean latency, right? If I go back to the yeah. median. Median, yes. This is impressively high, um, to say the least. Um, do you have got like, any explanation of that? Because, I mean, PMT really um, has more shortcomings than features, and, uh, but, but it's not, it's not like, like it should be that slow, right? I, yeah, that I have no idea. That was just the test results. OK, um, yeah. Which, I mean, so granted, because what I was doing was I was actually using uh, this type of a setup. So right, we are actually doing data. We are doing extra processing data, or we are doing extra processing on the data, right? So technically, there is a slight overhead doing steps two, possibly three and four. Oh, okay, yeah. So, so that, there, there might be a little bit overhead that we introduced, but yeah. I mean, in general, because what we were finding out um, is we're actually getting the basically, or your um, your messages are being dropped because we can't handle all of them. Okay, that's that's terrifying. Um, <laughs> 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 no, um, can I ask you what what kind of messages you were generating? Was that like a vector or like a uniform vector? Um, so we are doing multiple messages. Um, so it, it kind of depends. Um, for example, this is the more detailed version. Um, so that feedback, which is the topmost arrow from the merger back off or back up to the dynamic cutoff calculator, what we're actually doing is we're sending basically command information saying either increase or decrease this value. Um, so that's one case. Um, the other main case was from the two paths to the merger itself. So what we were trying to do is send a bunch of data, um, but that was, it was formatted type data, so string data. Um, and then even, so that was kind of where we ended up doing a lot more of the signals and slots um, type mechanisms. But even within the, 
peak detector to the bandwidth and timing analyzers, and then from the analyzers to the pattern matcher. Those blocks, all of those connections, we ended up doing the, um, the second technique, the uh, fixed data strings, basically. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from the audience? No? I have a, so I do have another question, actually, about the message passing and the signals and slots. Um, yeah, the strings, the strings hurt. Um, but uh, I think you said your message payloads were 16 kilobytes? Hmm? Is that, you, you said your message payloads are 16 kilobytes, is that right? Mm -mm. Oh, no, I must have misread that in the slide then. Okay, I was, yeah, I was gonna ask um, for the benchmarking. Oh, for the, okay, for my benchmarking, it was 4,096 Oh, yeah, it's right there on the left integers. side. I see, okay. Yeah. All right, got it. All right, yeah. uh, any other questions from the audience? No? Okay, thank you very much, Christopher. Okay.